I'm going to speak for a little while on varieties and a few things. Uh, Mark Freeman, our East Georgia agronomist, is going to talk. And then John Snyder will share with us some stuff. He's uh, getting done teaching a class. Um, you know, you've heard a bunch about what the Cotton Commission does. Again, you know, we appreciate your support through them. They do a lot to help us as far as but providing funding and providing research support, we appreciate it again. So we want to thank you for that. Um, as far as a couple other things, you know, you got a lot of local county meetings. We got some agents in here. If you guys uh, need county cotton production guides, we've got those printed. They're at the local county offices. If they are out, let them know, and then they can let me know. We can get some more to you. Um, they got a lot more in depth information about what we'll go over today. So. To get started, I want to talk about something I typically don't like to talk about. It's last year, right? And hindsight's 2020, right? I can't stand when somebody goes back and tells you exactly what happened, why, and all that kind of thing, right? If you think about last year, you think about the year before, they were both good. Were you affected by weather, right? And honestly, they were not good. But honestly, 16 was what? Extraordinarily hot, right? Historic heat. And all things considered, I think we came out a lot better than I thought we would. Last year was tough but also, right? Last year was kind of the opposite. It was really cloudy. We had a lot of rain, and we didn't do well. I think as far as yields, they were they're way off, you know, two, 300 pounds. I hadn't heard anybody who had a great year last year, right? I said if you made a good, good, good year last year, you're either lying or you're in some nook of the woods we don't know about, right? So last year was rough. If you think about weather, there's two main things to look at, and then we'll go through both of those real quick. The first is temperature, right? And temperature and rainfall. Think about temperatures last year. They weren't too out of the ordinary, other than the fact that you know May, June, and July were pretty normal. And again, this is just generalized information for Georgia. But August and September were above normal. If you think about above normal temperatures in August, September, that's not necessarily a good thing, right? And that's kind of what we saw. We also saw a lot of what early on? A lot of rainfall and cloudy weather, right? This is just kind of a, a graph or a, a graph showing uh, basically solar radiation for each month. And this is May, and you're looking at the percent difference in 2017 compared to the previous five year average. And this is data from our UGA weather stations, average over Midville, Tipton, and Moultrie. So not just one point, but kind of the whole state, right? This, if you look at here, you can see if you got bars above zero, you had more than average sunlight, below zero, less than average sunlight. You can see some up and down, you can see some significant cloudy weather there. Not too big a deal because in May, what's happening? We're getting a crop up, right? Cloudy weather probably keeps us from crusting and may help us get some of that crop out of the ground that we wouldn't have. June's a little different story. If you look at June, you see what? Everything's what? Below zero, right? We have a lot of cloudy weather, a lot of significantly cloudy weather, and a lot of lack, you know, a, a lack of sunlight in general for the whole month of June. If you look at July, kind of the same thing. A lot of days we were at or below average sunlight or average solar radiation. So what does that mean? We know sunlight is important for plants, right? We know lack of sunlight can be a bad thing, right? But what's happening to the crop? in May, June, May, June, and July. A lot of things, right? Two main things I think of is the plant is getting ready to make fruit and develop cotton, right? And it's also developing what? The root system. You think about cotton root development, it peaks at first bloom and tails off pretty quick after that, right? So you got really wet soils and cloudy weather, what are you gonna have? Pretty weak plant, right? Then you have above average temperatures in August and September, spells for stress, right? You guys know it was wet last year. This is just an illustration of historical rainfall for last year compared to the past 123 years. You basically look at this year. If you have the number one, it was the driest year on record, 124 would be the wettest month on record. May was a very wet month for South Georgia and Georgia in general. June was even wet. Right? If you look historically, we're talking about very wet. I think Alabama, South Alabama is the second wettest month on record. Very wet, a lot of rainfall. July was what we considered to be normal, right? As far as average rainfall in, in general. August, 
in southwest Georgia for, you know, for instance, actually was dry, right? Think about that, that's 29 of 124 as far as dry months, right? Pretty dry. September looks wet, but when did we get all that rain? One shot, right? Got a hurricane. So if you think about cotton production, every month's important, but what's the most important month? I honestly think it's August, right? August, you can have a good August, you can have a good what? You can have a good cotton crop, right? If you think about August from the standpoint if we were dry to normal, we had a, you know, had a, a lack, of a, a short root system, so to speak. We had some stress plants as far as heat, which spells for bad things, right? You think about what happened in September? We had Irma, right? We all knew it blew the cotton crop around. We know it affected the crop. I got pushed to try to give estimates on yield losses, and that's something that's never fun, right? If I'm, I'm either too high or too low, depending on what side of the fence you're on, right? Long story short, we did a bunch of things to estimate yield losses from the hurricane. One thing we did was we got county agents like some of these guys in here to go actually into your field to pick up cotton in a set area. And then we ran that cotton through the wind cleaners of the microgen, and we actually got a pound yield loss per acre of how much cotton was blown on the ground. Does that make sense? So we got about 50 fields. On average, it was 206 pounds that was blown onto the ground. All right? That was pretty substantial. But that was probably portioned towards most of the part of the crop that was actually closer to being harvested or where we had a lot of bowls open. You do a lot of other figuring, and quite honestly, it was pretty hard to get to a yield loss that was less than 150 pounds per acre. All right? So we know the storm was bad. It's bad for some people, some bad, worse for others, um, better for others. So all things considered, last year was rough for several reasons, but you know, I heard this term, two, 300 pound yield loss are, are all from average, right? You think about 100 pounds from the hurricane, 100 pounds from white flies, if you know, <laughs> we know what we're talking about, and then 100 pounds due to that short stature plant that had you know, issues with roots and had a tough August and September. That makes sense. All things considered, you know, it points to a bad year. I think Cater talked about it at the general session, but you can still see cotton yields are improving in Georgia. We still got situations where we can make good yields in Georgia, and hopefully, we'll just have a normal year as far as weather, and we can do better. Right? <coughs> That's all I got for last year. Anybody got any comments? So I look at temperatures. You know, so this number. This number here is this. I, actually, what I did was look at average temperatures. In all honesty, I think it was night temperatures, maybe it up, because daytime temperatures weren't that hot in August. I think that may have something. Another year before they were planning to last year. Really? That makes sense. Yeah, well, like I said, yeah, that's the thing. We had, we had August and September were hot. I mean, that, that is part of it. Yeah. So. We just need a normal year now. So, moving forward. Again, I don't know the, the take home from this other than the fact that weather plays a role in our production system every year, right? And it's one of those things you can control what you can and recognize Mother Nature plays a role in other things. So, moving forward, you got three speakers. You've heard a ton of stuff today about cotton. I don't want to drown you in variety data, but I do want to mention variety selection is, you know, is from a standpoint of it's an important decision to make in cotton. We have to make one every year. And if you think about varieties, it's gotten what? More and more complicated, right? There's more and more varieties to choose from every year. You know, we went from having one variety with 555, we lost it. Now we've got more choices than ever. I put together, you'll see a slide in a minute, I put together looking at the all different cotton varieties in Georgia and I came up with 65 different cotton varieties you guys could potentially plant. I never thought we'd have that many to choose from, right? So again, it's important. You know, there's two main recent sources of information from us, UGA, on cotton varieties. One of them is the OBT program, Official Variety Testing Program, and the other is our uh, UGA On Farm Cotton Variety Evaluation Program. In this program, we basically take the set of the best of the best cotton varieties that work with seed companies, and we put these varieties in on-farm trials with agents, with farmers like you, and large plot strip trials that are replicated within the location and across the state. So this is just a snapshot of last year's program and worry about all the numbers other than the fact that 
You can see we had 19 on farm trials, 10 were irrigated, 9 were dry land. And if you think about a program or a data set, this is a pretty robust data set from the standpoint of, you know, it's only one year worth of data. But you can see these varieties are compared in environments where we had yields as low as four, less than 500 pounds up to over 1,300 pounds, right? So a, a very diverse set of environments to look and see how these varieties perform. This is a summary of the data. You can see how these varieties are sorted out with regards to average yield from, from highest average yield to lowest average yield. There's a lot of different comparisons you can potentially make there. You can, one way to do that is using this column here. This is some statistics where we used LSD or least significant different letters. And what you basically can do is make any comparison between varieties. And the varieties are the same if they have the same letter followed, right? So everything with an A is statistically at the top. Everything with a B is the same. Everything with a C is the same, so forth, right? So you guys can make those comparisons. We know the differences in yields are important. You know, if you look from top to bottom, there's about 180 pounds difference from top to bottom. And again, these are the best of the best, right? So we know how valuable that is. The other thing to look at is consistency of performance. If some varieties are very consistent and doing well, or doing above average, doing well a lot of times, and some are less consistent. So if you look at this column here, this is the percent of time a particular variety did above the trial average. And in this case, you can see I've got four varieties highlighted, and they get above the average trial average at least 89% of the time, right? So both were very consistent as far as being above average. <coughs> as far as top performance, you could use any of these four columns. This is the percent of time a variety finished numerically number one, with the two, three, or four. And you can see here there's three varieties here that were in the top four at least 85% of the time, right? So long story short, this data shows to me that there's some pretty clear differences with regards to how consistent some of these varieties are as far as how they perform. Again, I got some handouts up here. You guys haven't got to uh, memorize this. We've got it on our web page as well. Sometimes we're able to look at these varieties and how they perform in the trials for two years. These are the six varieties we had in our own farm trials for two years. And you can see how they sort out with regards to average yield. And you can see how they are as far as statistical differences. These four at the top were the most highest as far as yield, and they were better than the other two. As far as the same way, if you look at consistency, those four were more consistent as far as giving you above average yields um, and, and top performance as well. What I did here is, is basically took those 39 on farm trials and tried to look to see if there was a situation where a variety did better in a higher yield environment or a lower yield environment. And so what I did is I took those 39 trials, and this table here is the comparison of all 39 trials. This table here is the 13 out of the 39 trials we averaged less than 1,000 pounds, and you can see how those varieties sort out. In this case here, this is the 12 trials of 39 where we averaged over 1,200 pounds, and you can see how they sort out. Long story short, there's a little different, subtle differences there, but nothing really sticks out in my mind, at least from this data set, that would help me pick where to put a variety from these six. Every year we try to come up with a different set of varieties to look at. We work with seed companies to do that. We try to get ones that you guys are going to plant and have planted. You know, every year I get questions, well, you didn't look at this variety we had looked at. You know, just to mention that, you know, it's a situation where you've only got a set number of varieties to look at. Sometimes you've seen them more than one year. You know, it's time to move on. You know, one big question with 2017's data is if you look in there, it's not any fighting 444. We planted a lot of that last year. We didn't see it in 2017, but we've got data from 2016, and you see how it did. And you can also see how it did uh, in 2015. So we've got that data for you. You guys are welcome to use it. As far as all these new varieties, there's a lot of them out there. This is where the OVT data comes into play. We have that data, it's out. Um, we've got tables, the stuff is online. I'll have some summary tables done for you here soon that'll be on our webpage that you guys can use as far as looking at new varieties. So again, you know, as far as varieties go, we've got a lot of data on some varieties. I feel pretty confident in how, how these varieties that we've tested look. 
and I think you can use that data. You know, you can always plant new varieties. I encourage you to try new things, but quite honestly, we have a lot of information on some and feel pretty confident in predicting which ones will do better or be more consistent than others. Real quickly, fiber quality. You know, we talk about fiber quality in there for quite a bit about, you know, having good quality cotton. As far as the average crop in Georgia, this is the third year in a row that we've had the best quality crop we've ever had. Does that make sense? And if you think about that, you, know, you just look at our average crop in 2017, on average, we had a loan value premium of over four cents. That's a good thing, right? Like it's good quality cotton as anywhere in the country. There's two main reasons for that. One of them is harvest weather and harvest timing. The other is what? Varieties, right? We're planting a lot of varieties that have good fiber quality, and that's a good thing. One thing I do try to do every year, and, I, and I've got it for every year, this is from 2015, is I use that on-farm data to look at the value of fiber quality and choose an A variety, right? We've got some varieties that are very good with regards to fiber quality. Long story short, this table here shows the impact of fiber quality and yield potential on how valuable or how, how much money you can make off of choosing a particular variety. And what the data shows and it shows it every year, is that yield potential outranks fiber quality every time, right? So if you have the potential to choose a better yielding variety, that's more important than the one with better fiber quality. Um, and we see that every year. Don't want to spend much time on vigor, other than to say in Georgia, we deal with vigor issues because cotton seed's expensive and we don't plant any more seed than we need to as far as having plants, right? We also have a lot of small seeded varieties that have what? Pretty poor vigor, right? So again, we, we talked about vigor. We know how to compare varieties with regards to vigor. The best way to do that is what? Seed size, right? So one thing I've got for you that's on the web page, it's in our handout up here, is I took all the different cotton varieties that you guys could plant in Georgia and broke them up based on seed size. And what this does is potentially give you a way to compare vigor between varieties, right? So ones on the right here all have seed sizes that are less than 4,500 a pound. And if you think about vigor, these are going to have relatively better vigor than what? These on this end, right? If you think about it from that standpoint, if you think about what we're planting in Georgia, we're planting a lot of varieties that are what? Very, very small seeds. You think about 555, you planted cotton in those days, that was considered to be a pretty poor vigor variety, very small, and it ran about 5,100 to 5,200 seed per pound. We're going a lot of varieties that are even smaller than that now. So again, it kind of puts things in perspective. I take this same chart and color coded it by company just to show a couple things. To make two examples, one is, is that you know, certain brands have reputations for vigor or lack of vigor, right? But that doesn't always count for every single variety. If you look on the left, you know, there's a lot of varieties that are green that are from Delta Pine. There are a lot of small seeded varieties. Not all of them are small. If you look on the right here, Bayer is in red. You know, their reputation of having good vigor, larger seed varieties. But if you look at their best yielding variety, 6182, it's considered to be what? Small. And so vigor may not be there at least compared to those others. Don't want to talk about pigs much. We don't have time other than the fact to say that we've got our PGR classification chart updated for this year. If you've seen it in the past, we have some differences with regards to how to manage these varieties. Some of them are more aggressive than others. We've grouped these varieties based on that. Um, if, if you're interested, you can get this. Again, we're a long ways away from spraying pigs on cotton, um, but you'll see it coming up this summer. Don't want to spend much time on planting dates just so you guys can hear from these other guys, but you know, as far as planting dates go in Georgia, the biggest thing I'll say in, as far as planting dates is we have a wide window. We can take advantage of that spread risk. But if I was going to say one sentence, it'd be, I'd rather you plant cotton in May than in June to maximize cotton. Right? A lot of people are pushing planting dates back. That's fine. You can do well. But in general, you know, May is going to be better than June. Last thing I've got, and I'll let Mark and John go, is last year I got a lot of questions on skip row cotton. 
Never thought we'd talk about skip row cotton in 2018, right? If you think about skip row cotton, it kind of makes sense from the standpoint of potentially saving money and from all these foliar diseases that we deal with, right? And the fact that airflow may improve foliar disease and, and maybe help you that way. As far as skip row cotton goes, there's two things I feel like it does. It saves you money up front, but you're probably going to lose money in the end, right? Because in most cases, you're going to make less yield than you would with a solid planting, and that's going to outweigh the savings you have as far as seed costs. I did some research this year. I want to show you two examples of that um, from this research. This is a trial we did right across the road. You can see there's five different row configurations here. Solid two and one, four and one, three and one, and two and two. And you see, as far as wind yields go, these two are the same, and they're better than those three. Right? In this case, to my surprise, the two in one skip made just as good as a solid plant. Right? It can happen. Right? It's not out of the realm of reality. These other patterns didn't do as well, you lost money on those. This is another trial from the expo that we did. It's a little more realistic, I think, of what you expect to see. You have a solid planting, two and one, four and one, and two and two. And you can see in this case, both those varieties. What made the most money? Solid planting cotton, right? So I don't think my idea on skip row cotton has changed. The researchers always said that if you want to maximize cotton yields, and if you're in this current situation as far as cotton prices, the best way to maximize productivity and, and be, uh, do the best as far as economics is to plant solid planting rows. That's a true skip. <coughs> yeah, so I did true skips, Tim. That's one thing to look at. So my reason for doing True skips is quite honestly because it's easier, right? But my thought is, is all the data is set on all these skips is that you make less cotton, you make less yield, it outweighs your savings. My thought is, is let's do a big skip. That's certainly going to be bigger as far as air. You're going to see the maximum chance to change something with airflow. That's the only reason I think you see a difference with skip row today versus 10, 20 years ago. is because of all, if you affected diseases and that kind of thing, and I don't think you did. But that is right. You got all different patterns you can potentially use. That, quite honestly, the, the biggest thing I see is if you were able to somehow save time or money with harvest, harvest, you know, from maybe doing some kind of modified skip, you might get make it work. Again, that's all I got. I want to make some time for these other guys. You guys have got our website, ugacotton.com. I've got some handouts up here that you guys can grab. If you got any questions, I can answer them afterwards. Mark, I'll let you uh, get started. All right, glad to be here. Um, if you guys don't know me, I am uh, Jared's extension counterpart in uh, the east, east side of the state, based out of Statesboro slash Midville, kind of split my time there. Um, I'm going to go over a few little side projects I did on my own um, in Midville and East Georgia. i got to give you a little bit of background. Uh, last year I had to follow Jared around the state at uh, county production meeting time, and, and while we were doing that, almost, almost every county at the end of the meeting, somebody would come up to us and say something about, you guys need to look into deer, deer eating all the cotton, you know. So I, I took it upon myself to do something, get some impact out there. So what I did in the spring is I kind of surveyed East Georgia cotton fields and just kind of observed how, what the deer were doing. Noticed a few different things. The first, first one, sometimes they ate the whole plant, they ate the whole terminal and the cotyledons. These died, never came back. Sometimes they kind of lightly browse on some bigger plants like that. But the most, com most common damage I saw was at about the two to three leaf stage, they would eat the terminal and they would leave the tide leaves. So these plants would come back, uh, but they would, maturity was set back on them uh, significantly. This was just a, another picture I, I took where they would actually pull them out and not eat them, kind of a waste. Um, so the, First thing I want to do is to kind of look at what's the impact, you know, what's the, what's the yield loss that we're seeing from this. 
Um, is it an isolated event, or are they can just continually feeding on it over and over and over? Um, and, and there's other things that happen besides just yield loss. So we get that big delay in maturity. Um, that's going to affect your PGR management program later on. That's going to affect your defoliation management program. We also get a loss of uh, apical dominance. So instead of having one true uh, leader stem, they kind of turn into a, a viney looking bush. Um, so you know that that plays into uh, plays into it as well. So this is just a picture. This plant was actually protected. I put a fence around it so they couldn't get to it. To so just kind of show you the damage that we were seeing. Now this was in Burke County, and this entire field, literally the entire field looked like this, except for where I had the fences around. Um, also saw where they would they tended to basically feed down the road. So it wasn't it wasn't spottiness, randomness. It would actually be big large gaps in the in the road. So uh, I wanted to kind of get a, a, a simulated deer defoliation trial going, set up something, a uh, small plot of research in, in, in Midville at the, um, at the research station there. We, uh, we thinned some stands, so we had the exact same plant stands going into it. And then I, I took uh, shears and I removed the terminals of the plants at the two to three leaf growth stage. So the treatments I used were an untreated check where I didn't cut any, and then where I would cut 25, 50, 75, and 100% of the terminals from the plant stand. And another thing that I did, you know, deer, if you do have a deer problem, it's not gonna be something that, it's not gonna be an isolated event. They're not gonna just feed one time and then leave. So I threw in a couple treatments where I defoliated the first time, waited 10, I think it was 10 days, and uh, came back and defoliated it a second time. When we look at yield, you know, pretty much what you would expect. The more aggressive treatments, the, the, the more defoliation we caused, the more yield loss we got. We got yield loss from the, the most aggressive treatment, which was um, a repeated feeding at 75%, compared to the untreated check, was a 480 pound yield loss. So it's pretty significant, and that, that treatment right there is not out of the ordinary in many places. How many, said, how many times you come back and do it? Once. So you did just twice? Yes. That's just twice for each yes. person. Um, another thing to look at here, we didn't have any, any statistical yield loss until we got above 25% feeding. So another thing beyond just, uh, you can take a picture of it. So beyond just the actual yield loss, this was something we saw. We didn't mean to do this, but since there's that, that at least two to three weeks of, of delayed maturity, when we put the defoliant on there, the the, uh, the plots where we had aggressive deer treatment, the, the leaves just weren't mature and it wasn't ready for defoliation. So what happened was our check plots, you know, they looked great, they defoliated perfectly, over here, where we weren't ready for defoliation, the leaves weren't mature, we got leaf desiccation and stuck leaves. So, you know, this gave you an idea I can do a little little rating. So I did a, a real quick one through five rating. And I just rated plots one if it had uh, no stuck leaves, five if it was 100% uh, stuck leaves, like that plot right there. So the same thing happened um, as the as the uh, level of feeding damage went up, treatment went up, so did the level of leaf default or leaf desiccation. So we had more stuck leaves on our more aggressive um, treatments compared to our check. Now the same thing, the same people that were coming and talking to us about deer last year were saying, "I'm going to put out ad logic strictly for deer control." So we, we know that AgLogic or, or Aldicarb is excellent on thrips. We know that it's excellent on nematodes. But we're really not sure if it's worth spending that money strictly for the deer. So we set up a couple on-farm locations, one in Burke and one in Jenkins County. It, it was a large plot. Uh, plots were 100 foot long by six rows. Um, six replications. And then we visited the sites four times. Um, first time was at the one leaf growth stage. 
Then we came back two weeks later after that, two weeks later, two weeks later on the fourth. Here's a couple of pictures just to uh, kind of show you what we were doing. We placed flags at a particular spot in each row randomly, and then we, we uh, counted damaged plants on a certain row foot from that flag each time. So we came to the same place every time we visited the site. Now this is just a <clears throat> summary of both treatments. And uh, this is site visit number one at one tree leaf. We had no damage, which was, um, this, this was pretty, pretty common. I didn't, when I surveyed fields, we didn't see any damage, usually until two or three leaf growth stage, which, which happened here when we came back on the second visit. We got some damage, and then the third and the fourth, we had almost 100% damage. When I break it up by treatment, again, no damage there on the first one. When we look at um, out of car versus untreated at the, at the uh, second site visit, no significant difference. Same thing in the third, and same thing at the fourth visit. So the Jenkins County trial was very similar, although the numbers just weren't as high, the deer population wasn't as, wasn't as high there. Same thing, no significant difference at any, um, any site visit. Now we all know this switching gears, um, we had the, the launch of the Extend and the Enlist uh, herbicide traits this, in 2017. The Georgia growers, we all know, did a great job. We had zero official um, to the Department of Ag drift complaints. Um, but we wanted to know, what do we do if we do get drift? So what's our management strategy? You know, if, if we do get 240 or dicamba on the cotton, what is the management strategy? So we wanted to look at PGR management, irrigation, and what about um, additional nitrogen after, after that injury. So the rate that we used for the trial was um, what weed scientists refer to as the quote unquote drift rate. It was an extremely small rate of, of 2,4-D and dicamba. Um, the dicamba was not a high enough rate to get any injury, so I had to throw that chunk of data out and it didn't do anything. I did get some good injury with the 2,4-D though, so I'm just gonna focus on that. So we had a bunch of different Mepiquot um, rates and timings post, post oxen injury. Uh, we had oxen injury, we, we spread it at nine leaf as well as, as uh, first bloom on another section. We had three picks rates of zero, six, and 12 following uh, the 2,4-D application. And we also had two timings, one day, and then um, uh, triggered at visual injury. So visual injury didn't happen until about 10 days after treatment. Also had all these metaquat treatments in uh, three different irrigation zones. So I had it in a dry land, a uh, UGA checkbook method, and a UGA checkbook plus 50% method. Long story short, there was no, um, there was no significant um, differences whatsoever for any of the metaquat treatments, but we did get some good data from the from the um, irrigation. So when we grouped all the oxen plots together, and we compared the dry land versus the checkbook and the checkbook in half, we did have statistically higher yields in the checkbook and the checkbook plus 50 percent. We also did not have any difference between the two irrigation treatments. So if irrigation is available. To me, it makes sense to uh, continue to irrigate it, but irrigate it to UGA recommendations. Any additional water beyond that did not, uh, did not help yield at all. So what about nitrogen? So we sprayed, um, this was a different small trial that we did in Midville. Sprayed that low drift rate at first bloom. Then we applied four different nitrogen rates 0, 33, 66, and 100 units of N. And this is additional nitrogen beyond the uh, regular fertility program that we were using. So I compared that to a check. What we saw the check was um, not sprayed with 2,4-D and got no additional nitrogen. Compared to all these were sprayed with 2,4-D and then got the four nitrogen treatments. 
no difference whatsoever for any of the any of the uh, extra nitrogen treatments at all. So what's it mean for management? Again, just just went over that. But if, if you have the ability to irrigate, um, continue to irrigate would probably be the best bet. But don't over irrigate. Um, the uh, Mepiquot applications didn't have any bearing on yield, and at this time, uh, wouldn't recommend any additional fertilizer to uh, assist coming out of that herbicide injury. And I got, I don't know how much time we got. There's a certain grower that had done this a while that had deer pressure. So this all different when you went from bone guard one to bone guard two. I haven't heard anything about that. I'm just saying more deer than on cotton. And I, yeah, and it's yeah, it's definitely a regional issue. Thank you, Thank you. Yeah, so the deer population just happened to go going up there and got a drought or something changed in the cotton plant where they're eating more. I mean, I'm, I'm asking the question. I, I, I think people are not shooting goes. That's just my, okay. that's just the person. I don't know any of the treatments and peppers and all of this kind of thing. I have not, so I was, I was I thinking did, about it, but I used it. I used stuff uh, for my when I did soybean research. I mean, they could tear up a small, yeah. so, you know, four-row soybean plot. They could tear one up. I mean, dominant. So I, I spray hot sauces and stuff, and I felt like they work as long as it didn't rain. You know what I mean? Um, as soon as it rained, it washed up all. You know, the, the added stuff. And Clemson did some work last last year and this year with uh, soybeans with uh, hot sauces and insecticidal soaps. And I don't know what they saw in seventeen. You know, in 16, they had some success with the sex of soaps. I mean, you think about it, it, it works a lot of the issue, I think it rains off. We have a time to get around the interstate there, right across from RDC. That way. Anyway, the, uh, the deer are terrible there. And the only place they didn't eat for I made the kids want to scare them. I mean, they'd eat five foot up to it, and they just didn't want to get scared of it. So they can keep eating. So with the, uh, you were mentioning the delay in the church stop. So that would be a little bit of a delay. It would be a little bit of a delay. It would be a little bit of a delay. It would be a little bit of a delay. It would be a little bit of a delay. It would be a little bit of a delay. I talk a little bit, you know, usually I'll get up here and talk a little bit about that. I work on uh, on irrigation management or seedling vigor in the field and so on, but today I'm going to talk a little bit more about just some basic physiology, um, some of the work that we're doing to identify some of the weak links and cold tolerance. We're doing similar work with heat tolerance and that type of thing. And uh, I feel like this type of work is important for just identifying, okay, where are our weak points if we want to talk about improving performance in the future. And, you think about a lot of the different technologies that are out there now that are in widespread use, it's because we know what particular genes do, what particular processes are important, and what some of these weak links are. So this is more of a basic physiology type, uh, type of presentation, so uh, just a, a warning on the front end here. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about cold acclimation in cotton seedlings, but before I do, I'd like to acknowledge the Georgia Cotton Commission and the University of Georgia for their support of my program. And um, before I can really talk about acclimation processes in cotton seedlings, we need to ask the question, okay, what are some of the negative impacts of low temperature? Let me see, does this work? All right, good. Um, we need to talk a little bit about the negative impacts of low temperature on seedling development. And these are pretty well established impacts. You can, uh, I'm, I'm citing peer reviewed literature here, but um, there's a tremendous amount of extension information on, on uh, seedling responses to low temperature, whether it's chilling injury or whatever. Um, but suboptimal temperature decreases, decreases photosynthesis, decreases seedling growth, and it can limit seedling survival as well. And so when we start talking about acclimation, I thought this was something that probably would have been done a long time ago where people had documented acclimation to cold temperature conditions in cotton. Um, but when I started looking this up, we didn't really find, you know, I didn't really see a whole lot. We had some older papers where individuals had taken 
um, leaf discs from seedlings that have been grown in growth chambers under cooler temperature conditions, and then they measured that photosynthetic response, and they did see a shift in the optimum temperature or even a threshold temperature. And then we have some, uh, several really nicely done studies, but they're not in cotton, documenting uh, acclimation based on growth, you know, previous growth environment. And then we have these two, it's the same authors, so we got one, one paper basically saying, no, there's no acclimation, um, and then another one saying there was, but in the follow-up paper, you know, so just to give you perspective, this paper right here, um, what they did is they, they exposed these plants to their, their preliminary exposure to low temperature was already what we would consider chilling temperatures, you know, uh, below 10 degrees C, um, I guess that's below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so they exposed them to this, and so they're already under under temperatures that cause injury, and then they put them into these sub-freezing temperatures, very close to freezing, and so anyway, they didn't see any acclimation. That's because they had already basically damaged, already injured the plant. Um, in this situation, the temperatures they used are really close to our cool germ uh, temperatures. So it's interesting that they did see it in one study, but the other. Anyway. These others are ones that say they talk about acclimation, but they really don't document acclimation at all. So um, there's still some room to kind of identify what's going on when we expose plants to these cool temperature environments. Does photosynthesis actually acclimate? And one of the only ways you can answer this is with a, a controlled environment study where you can control everything except temperature. Um, and so what what I wanted to know was first, you know, first off this. Does cotton acclimate to these low temperature environments? And then if it does, and this is something else that we haven't seen in the literature, which of these processes, which of these underlying processes that influence photosynthesis are kind of the weak links, okay? And so that's where, that's kind of the objective here. And so this was conducted at our UGA Envirotron facility in Griffin. Um, this is all one cultivar. I don't have a bunch of different cultivars here to show you. Um, and so we had a 2015 day-night temperature regime. You can see that black bars here, and then a 3020. That's our optimum day-night temperature regime. So that's in Celsius. I had somebody mention that I should, you know, reference back to Fahrenheit to make it easier to, to understand these numbers. So this optimum temperature here, we would say that cotton likes 86 degrees during the day and 68 at night. That's pretty much what this works out to. All right, um, and I guess. If we average this out, it works out um, you know, to about 60 degrees as an average overall for the day and the night. Okay? But if you'll look, it's enough, it's not enough to cause injury, but we have you know substantial reductions in plant height, number of main stem nodes, uh, dry weight, leaf area per plant. So all the stuff that indicates how that plant is performing, you can see that, that low temperature negatively impacts that. So to bring this back to something practical. This is why whenever you've got low temperatures coupled with high thrips pressure, you see a lot more uh, injury. Why is that? We're putting on nodes at a much, let's say nodes at a much slower rate so that the, the impact of those thrips or any sort of early season stresses, uh, whether it's thrips or other diseases, is just magnified if we have lower vigor, all right? Especially under these low temperature conditions. So we then took a subset of those plants and we put them in a chamber where we could we could alter the, the chamber temperature, but also the temperature in our, our portable photosynthesis system there. And we measured a number of different processes, okay? So this is uh, respiration. So this is dark respiration here, and this is leaf temperature. And I've got it starting from a direction that you're not gonna like here. So starting from, you know, going from low to high here. We're starting from high to low, going from high to low. But the main thing here is these dark circles are our low temperature grown cotton plants and uh, these white circles are going to be our optimum temperature grown plants. So the, the low temperature grown plants have a much different temperature response of respiration than the uh, optimum temperature grown plants. So there's some big differences here in how these processes respond. This is a form of acclimation that dark respiration is being affected. Um, we also measured a number of different photosynthetic parameters. This is net photosynthesis, and these are, um, if you'll recall, these are uh, indicators of the light reactions, so electron transport rate, and this would be gross photosynthesis here. So we also measured these temperature responses. Now, from this data set, for each plant, we have a temperature response for a single plant. We have a temperature response for every parameter. 
okay? So we have a net photosynthetic rate by leaf temperature. And I think this is where I shifted back for it to going from, uh, from low to high here, so just be aware of that. Um, and so what I can do is I can fit a curve to this data for an individual plant and I can assign a temperature, a below optimum temperature, causing a 50% decline in any given process relative to the optimum temperature, okay, relative to 30 degrees. I can assign that number and I can apply it across the board. That's telling me how cold tolerant that particular plant was, okay? So the higher this number, the more cold sensitive that plant would be, all right? The higher the number, the more cold sensitive that plant would be, all right? So the, this T50 value, for example, um, is just saying, okay, for these, it's somewhere between 10 and 15 degrees that we see our 50% decline, all right? And what this means is that, uh, so here's for our 20, you know, our low temperature and our optimum temperature here. What this means is that we have a particular sensitivity of net and gross photosynthesis, that we have uh, essentially these processes, electron transport rate is the, is the most sensitive process to low temperature. And then, and then one of the things we see shift substantially is respiration response to growth temperature environment, okay? So we're able to pinpoint which of these are the most sensitive, but also which one of these processes acclimates to low temperature conditions. So all this shows, this is the change in that threshold temperature as a function of, of growth environment. So if we grow plants under low temperature conditions, all this is saying is that net photosynthetic rate uh, shifts that threshold temperature over about two and a half degrees, okay? The threshold temperature becomes two and a half degrees lower. All right, so that is, and it is significantly different relative to plants that are grown under optimum temperature conditions. So this is documentation of acclimation in cotton. And if you look at respiration, we see that it is much more temperature sensitive. So if respiration is really temperature sensitive, and this is the process that's burning carbon, right? Instead of taking up carbon, it's burning carbon. Um, that plant can respond to growth environment. That's all that means. It can respond in a more efficient manner and decrease the carbon losses, which then results in acclimation of net photosynthesis. All right? So that seems to be one of the big things that are affected. And I already told you that the, um, and this is, this is getting into something I covered, this will be the second time I covered this today. I just came back from my physiology class, so you guys will have to bear with me for just a minute here. Um, so these are the, the light reactions, the thylakoid reactions. And I told you those electron transport processes were really sensitive to low temperature, right? I mentioned that just previously, that even in, in both, both chambers, doesn't matter whether there was, um, you know, whether it was a low temperature environment or whatever, these were some of the most sensitive processes, okay? Now I'm not gonna go through every single thing here. I'm gonna kind of box some of this in to make it, make it simple. So during the light reactions, we have the initial absorption of light by the photosystem. So this would be photosystem two here. Um, and so we're just gonna abbreviate that here with ABS, okay? Um, within the photosystem, then we have the trapping of that energy. So that electron, basically moving electron from one place to the next. Um, this is, they're just uh, gonna refer to that as energy trapping. And then electron transport in between the photosystems here is just referred to as electron transport. So there's our abbreviation there. And then getting an electron from here all the way out here to NADPH, which is our last step before we go into the next phase of photosynthesis. We'll just call that reduction, okay? So don't worry about all these details. It's just we have absorption of light, trapping of that energy, electron transport, and then reduction. Now, the reason this matters, and this is even worse. This one's even worse. I don't even want to explain all the abbreviations in this one. But the key here is there is a technique that's referred to as OGIT fluorescence. It's a new fluorescence technique. We can put this thing onto a leaf. I can take a measurement. It takes one second to do this measurement, okay? And I can generate all this data. This data allows me to pinpoint which processes are being limited, okay? That's the main point I want to get across to you. Don't worry about all these other details, but we can figure out whether it's absorption of light, trapping of that energy, electron transport and reduction, with a measurement that takes us one second to complete, okay? Now, 
from those two chambers I told you about. We took leaf discs and we exposed them to a range of temperatures, measured these parameters I just mentioned using a fluorometer. Here's some of the temperature response curves, don't get too hung up in this. What we see is there's different sensitivities to decreasing temperature, and yes, I'm moving back the other direction now. Um, but we expose the plant to low temperature conditions, back to 30 degrees, and then document recovery. Okay, so if there's lasting damage, you would see it as a lack of recovery. So don't worry about this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sum it up into just some key bullet points here, okay? Um, rather than walking through every temperature curve. What we found with this method was that all of these processes, if you just look at how the plants are performing under one growth environment versus the other, all these processes were limited by low growth temperature, okay? Also, there's this one parameter, it's just called the performance index. That's all this is. It accounts for all of those processes, and it was the most sensitive to low temperature. Okay, that's the, that's the second. So it's the most sensitive parameter, followed by electron transport, and then these other parameters as well. What about low temperature acclimation? If we do this particular approach, what we found is that many of these processes do acclimate to low temperature. So okay, that's fine. I want to take this to another, to a more applied sort of thing. You know? Again, more data, more numbers. You don't really have to focus on this. We can generate all these parameters and that's fine, but what does it mean in terms of seedling performance, okay? Could we use something like this to indicate seedling performance? And so what I did was I plotted, you know, we did multivariate analysis to plot, um, you know, leaf dry weight, plant dry weight, some of the growth parameters versus all these different fluorescence parameters. And what we find here is that a number of them are highly correlated with plant performance, the seedling vigor, okay? This one right here in particular, again, don't worry about what this, this means in particular, it's just that this one had really low CV, so it wasn't a lot of variability, and it was a very strong relationship with seedling and dry weight. So you can predict vigor with a, with a tool that is extremely rapid, and there's, like I said, there's a method here to do this. So there's more that we can get out of this, but I know I'm out of time, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and answer any questions that I don't, I don't even know what time it is, so I may not have time for questions. Yeah.